Amen, amen. Good morning, Streamline Church. How many are happy to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. We've come to honor and exalt the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers that are out there. You are more than appreciated this morning. If you can please stand to your feet, we're going to get started with our service. Let us start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you, God, for all you've done, for all you will do, Father. We trust you, Lord. This morning, God, we thank you for the air that we breathe, Father, for allowing us to wake up, Lord, and come to your house to exalt, to glorify, to lift the voice of praise to you, almighty God. This morning, Lord, receive our praise. Help those that are still on their way, those that are watching online, God, that they may feel your glory, that they may feel your presence, Lord. This morning, we are here for you. You are good, Lord, and there is no one like you. In your name we pray, amen and amen. This morning, let us start our worship by saying, or singing about the goodness of our God, the greatness of him. We honor you, almighty. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never ends. All my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Declare it this morning. All my life, so my life, you have been faithful. So, so
sing of your goodness. We sing of your mercy, almighty God. We worship you. We worship you. Come on, this morning, help us with your hands as we sing out that our God is good. How many believe it this morning? That our God is good, that his mercy endureth forever. Come on, help us with your hands, Streamline Church. This morning, we lift our voices to you, Almighty God. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. This morning, 
we're going to declare it, that we won't stop, that we can't stop, that we give him glory, that we give him honor. Hallelujah. Come on, help us with your hands this morning. We declare it that we won't stop praising you, Almighty God. I give you glory for all you brought me through. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward to follow after you. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. Sing it out, your presence. Your presence is an open door. We want you. Cross before my hope on things above, hope in you and in you, Jesus. The best is yet to come. Your presence is an open door. We want you. like that song where it it says it's addressing we want you lord and i 
And I just wonder if we can go back, back into that and just sing, I want you, Lord, like never before. And, and I know sometimes we can get into a worship service and we can be in a place to where we're, you know, just kind of meditating or maybe we're just solemn before the Lord. And here's what I want to do is as we go and sing this, would you invite, invite the Holy Spirit to just come in and where you are right now? That he does miracles, that we want, we want breakthrough. What does breakthrough mean? Breakthrough means this, that there are some walls, there are some obstacles, there are some barriers in my life, and God has promised to help us not go around them, but to go through them and to trust them. And that's where our faith increases even more. And so you may have something in your life right now to where, man, you need the promise of God. You need the help of God. In 2 Peter, I was reading last week that it said this, we have the precious promises from God. That means they are valuable, that when God looks at us and he has promises for us, that's because we're valuable and he doesn't see those things as just blanket terms. But no, I've promised you some stuff. And he promises his presence right now. And so maybe you just put your hands out. I want to pray for you. And then we're going to go into this. And we're going to personalize the worship today. Because the Holy Spirit, he's here and he wants to have a personal encounter with you. Would you just extend your hands this morning? Heavenly Father, we come to you today. You promise us a lot of things. You promise to be our defender. You promise to be a shield around us. You promise to go before us. You promise that you are beside us. You promise that you will be a refuge and you'll be a shelter. You promise the victory over everything. And so, Lord, we're asking for breakthrough in our trust and our faith in you. Say, God, I'm claiming those precious promises in my life today. And so, Heavenly Father, as we extend our hands... And we give you glory. We worship you. Come, Holy Spirit. We need you right now. We want you to fill this place. Walk up and down the aisles. Penetrate our hearts today, Lord, that we would be drawn to you this morning. In Jesus' name, lead us into this. Come on, sing it to him. I want you, Lord. Come on, I want you. Like me. Your presence is in open door. So come now, Lord, like never before. Come on, that's a breakthrough like never before. Let's sing this. Your presence is in open door. Can we sing like we're part of a choir? I want you, Lord.
Welcome to Streamline Church this morning. We've come to honor and exalt the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who, who says it, his promises remain. We believe it this morning. Amen, church. Happy Mother's Day once again to all the mothers this morning. We're going to put a minute on the clock from the front to the back. Wish every mother a, a happy Mother's Day this morning. Amen. Come on. God bless you and God bless you. Good morning, good morning. Oh, are you on, Marshall? Let's see if we're on. Okay. Okay. Hey, how's good it morning. going, Streamline Church? Good morning. Um, you know, uh, as we get, get together for Mother's Day, I just want to share real fast. Um, moms are so strong. You moms out Amen. there. Amen. You're so strong. You do things we don't see. You're up late at night. When we're sick, you pray for us when we're asleep. You, you, you care and think about us constantly. And I have a wonderful mom in my life. I'm so blessed, Marshall, to have an amazing mom who just loved on me like nobody's business and also makes really good food as well, just FYI, tamales and such. Um, and then I have my amazing wife. We have four kids um, and my daughter, Jessica, right here, who's also a mommy. And we have two grandbabies, and I feel so blessed. And I just want to say, moms, you're amazing. Um, love you guys. Amen. Hey, um, my mom was a good cook, too. Really? But, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the one thing that sticks out to me from remembering my mom is, um, you know, I, I, I raised my sons as a single dad. And, you know, she supported me, and she, like, guided me. To, to love on my sons, you know, like a, a mom would. And I'm not that I was always loving or whatever, because I, I wasn't. But anyway, that's, that's what I remember. That's I love that, Marshall. Thank you for sharing. I mean, there's just so many in the same situation, you know. And so we're just so glad you're here today. We want to welcome all our guests, first-time visitors. If you're online or in the house, we just want to say you could be somewhere else today. You chose to be here. It means a lot to us. Our ushers are up front right now with some orange cards. If it's your first time here or maybe your second time and you haven't filled one out, could you raise your hand as they walk towards the back? They're going to hand those out to you. We would love to connect with you guys. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank you. Um, I want to transition now to uh, the offering. Um, and we want to just talk real quick about ways to give. And we have a QR code up on the screen. Um, and this is how we support the ministry that is Streamline Church, right? And we're here to support bringing people to Jesus. It's so important. Amen. And so you're tithing, you're offering. It's a big deal. It keeps these doors open. It keeps us pursuing ministry on behalf of Jesus Christ. And so I just want to say to you guys, it, it is an honor, right, to be in such a lovely place with some amazing people. Amen? Amen. Come on, Amen. somebody. Um, and uh, next slide for me, please. Um, so we have the ladies' night coming up, right? And that's going to be Friday, May 19th, 6.30 p.m. Ladies, if you're in the house, right, moms, ladies, raise a hand real quick for me. It, you know, this is awesome. You want to get together and, and just talk about what it means to do life, what the, the Word of God says. So show up to this, 6.30 p.m., Friday, May 19th. Save it on your calendars. Uh, Marshall, the men have something. Yeah, right? we do. We have um, the men's conference coming up. I think it's next week. or the, Yeah, next week. So what you guys got to do is go to their website and register, and let's all 
meet up there or we can talk about that later. But this is Pastor Dave's last time going with Streamline Church. So all the men yeah. should get together and definitely. Head and this out is a there powerful and, event. Yes. Uh, Marshall, are you gonna what you know what? Why don't we pray for the offering? Okay, amen. Let's do that. Would you bow your heads yeah, with us this morning? Heads. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to to bless you, to to give you glory, Lord, and to honor you with our tithe and offering, Lord. And thank you for blessing us with everything we have, Lord, because it all comes from you. And, Lord, I, I just pray that you receive our offering and, Lord, use it for your glory, Lord, for your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be blessed as you give. We got a quick video for you guys. She is everything. A woman, a warrior, a wonder, a mother, a grandmother, mentor, auntie, stepmother, or any other way to say mom. She is the calm in stormy seasons. She brings peace, and when she speaks, she says everything. She encourages, captivates, sets us straight when we go astray and we can never repay her. She is favored and faithful and facing the future with a smile and an open hand, an open heart, an open home. She is bold, brave, never afraid to tell us what we need to hear. She is near, even when she's miles away. She is present, a gift, a grace, a goodness that cannot be reckoned. And she is respected, refined, resilient over time and time and time again. She proves her beauty is more than skin deep. She is brilliant. She is becoming and believing for the best, even in the face of the worst. She works and she wins, even when the odds are against her. She is strong, steady, ready for anything, and she does everything all the things that only she can do. She is true, tried, trusted. She embodies comfort, compassion, joy and gladness are her definition, patience and kindness, her disposition. She loves her children like it's nobody's business, but she makes it her business. And we all bear witness that she gives everything she has to everyone she has been given and it is written that beauty will flee and charm will mislead but a mother will always be and do and give because she is everything all right can we have all the mamas stand and everybody let's give them a hand this morning Come on, mama, stand up. Come, Man, that's like golf clap. Come on. You wouldn't be here without your mama, okay? We're so happy, moms, you were with us. And uh, my kids probably wouldn't be here today, not because they wouldn't be born, but because they probably wouldn't have eaten or anything if it was left up to me. But um, uh, this is going to shock you a little bit, Melissa, but she is the mother of hundreds of kids. And the reason I say that, <laughs> I told well, you, I told you it'd shock you a little bit. It. Um, it, it's because she works for WellSpace. Yes, I and do. And yeah, the tell them a little bit about okay. it real quick. I'm the director of women's health, so I have the pleasure of helping moms have healthy babies. Yeah. And at WellSpace Health, we deliver over 1,500 babies in Sacramento every year. Wow! So um, it's a it's an honor and a joy to do the work that I get to do. Wow. Well, we're so glad that you're taking that role. If you want to get in a fight with her, start argue, arguing with her about pro-life. Oh, yeah, don't go there with me. <laughs> she fights for babies. And so you've been doing that for, we didn't even plan on talking about this, but you, you've you been doing that for how long now? You don't have to say I, it if you don't want to. Over, no. I, I'm just going to be honest, for 40 years. I've been in women's health. That's what my career's been wow. dedicated to. And um, again, it's God put that on my heart, and I've had the honor of um, being able to do the work that I'm passionate about. If you add that up, that sounds like it's about 60,000 babies. 
Probably so. Fifteen hundred yes. a month. Yep. Or a, a year. I'm sorry. A, a fifteen hundred. Yes. A year. Yes. Yeah. But you can see how important her eyes are watering, and we love you for doing that and standing up for babies. Thank All right. You. We didn't plan on saying that, but no, we hey, didn't. <laughs> hey uh, tell us uh, tell us about the moms today okay. and what's happening. So moms, if you're a mom and that's a mom, a stepmom, a godmom, a foster mom, please stand up. We have something for you. Come on, mom, stand up, stand up, stand and up. And fur moms, fur moms are very important too. Yeah. All right. So. All right. Who's are we're giving it afterwards, oh, okay. but we're well, but we you look good. Have, you look good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, see, we didn't practice. Just little much. Vanna White. Oh, that's for old people. <laughs> and we're gonna give those after after service. Yeah, so there's a nice little <laughs> gift there for you, ladies, and we're glad you're here. And we have a special guest uh, speaker uh, to participate in Mother's Day with us today. But uh, we have some official things that are happening as far as uh, transition with our church and lead pastor, and so. Tell us about it. Yes. So um, in addition to being a mom of many, uh, I am also the Streamline Church business administrator. And I am also on the um, committee for searching for our new pastor to replace the unreplaceable Pastor Dave. Uh, we have been in this process for over a month, and we've done our due diligence. Our candidate that we are presenting is Pastor Char Blair. And um, just to tell you a little bit about what our committee has done, we have met with her. She did an extensive panel interview. She's come to the church twice and done Q&As. Once where Pastor Dave um, sat down with her, and last Sunday she came in. Anyone that was able to join us came in. They wrote questions, threw them in a bucket. How she many of you enjoyed that? I know there was a great, it sounded like it really went well. How many of you enjoyed that and you got to be here? Okay, don't be too excited. All right. <laughs> it was great because she, you could ask whatever you wanted. She pulled it out and she answered it. And um, her references are amazing. She has the complete support from the top people in our in the Assemblies of God Northern California District. They are there to support her. They highly recommend her. And I just don't feel like we could have had a better a better candidate that God put in our hands. Yeah. And and so we are officially the committee, the pastoral search committee is officially presenting Pastor Shar Blair as our candidate. And we will have a vote of our members on May 24th at 7 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. Yeah, and next week she's going to be with us and she's going to be uh, speaking. And so you'll be able to hear more of her heart. And I, I just want to share something. Um, I have to be careful because I don't want to sound partial, but I am. Okay, I'll just say that. All right. Um, our Assemblies of God leaders, our superintendent, our district, uh, district superintendent, our assistant district superintendent, and all the way down are so strongly behind her and believe in her ministry. And uh, it is not about the sex of the minister. It is the minister and the impact that a minister can make. And so I want you to keep that in mind. And many of you, you've already decided how you're going to vote in that. And I just want to share that with you. And then one other thing that is really important that we haven't really shared or highlighted much of is a God factor that's happened through this. This March, March 26, so it's coming up on uh, two months, I shared with you how I was resigning. God spoke to me in March and said, I want you to hear these words specifically, I said that I want you to resign and you don't have anything. I don't have anything for you, but I want you to resign and trust me. And that your days of lead pastoring Streamline Church are over. And, and that, that was hard. I had, it was a hit, but I knew it was the voice of the Lord. And then he said this. Is that you don't have vision for Streamline Church moving forward. I've given it to somebody else. I've given it to somebody else. Now let me take you somewhere. 
is last year, April 19th, at 1.23 in the morning, God woke up Pastor Shar Blair in the middle of the night. And when he spoke to her, it was, it was these words, is that you need to pray for Pastor Dave Novak. This is a year ago. And you need to pray for Streamline Church because he's going to be resigning, and I want you to submit your uh, resume to Streamline Church to be the next lead pastor. That was a year ago. That was a year ago. I'd never even thought of resigning a year ago. And so for the whole entire year, she's been praying and not knowing why and God whatever. And, and she had shared this with somebody else right when she got this message from the Lord. And like, you're not, Dave's not resigning. That's not happening. And then all of a sudden, this person shared it with her, which happened to be our assistant district superintendent and said, did you hear that uh, Dave Novak resigned yesterday? And it just rocked her so hard because she knew she needed to turn in her, res her resume, which she had already started filling out a year ago, only for Streamline Church. Is that powerful? And so God said this, you don't have vision for Streamline Church moving forward. I've given it to somebody else. He started a year ago. And she has such crazy vision. God has been, I just like div divinely tormenting her, keeping her up. She's been praying. Holy Spirit's been moving in her life. And there is something, I've told you guys this, something great is coming ahead for Streamline Church. And I believe the best days are yet to come. And it's so weird to say this is happening and I'm not going to be in that, in that role. But God is going to, I, I can't wait to see what God is going to to do. Amen. Can we just give the Lord a hand for just his work? So here's what's happening with me. As I've been going through uh, this, this time of God resi of resigning and God speaking to me about uh, pastor, you know, resigning and then also uh, beginning to move forward in, and, and sharing the message of helping people to break, um, have breakthrough in the, with the power of dad issues, I was like, God, what do you want me to do? And it was about serving, pastor, uh, serving pastors. And I really felt that God was telling me to move into like a, an assistant pastor role to be able to help a pastor. And then as I've been going through this process and praying and just seeking the Lord and getting counsel, God just began to just show me, look, it is about serving pastor, uh, a pastor, but it's more than one pastor. It's pastor's. And so what God is now birthing in my heart moving forward is that I'm going to go alongside and be able to speak at churches and, and be there, there to empower pastors, to be able to share my book, share the message of my book, and then also to just serve pastors in whatever capacity. And so what we're doing is on June 25th, that will be my last Sunday here at Streamline. And God has already been opening doors for me to go and serve other pastors. So I'm all about helping people break through the power of dad issues, but also to serve pastors and to serve churches. And so um, that is coming up pretty quick, but I believe that God is like, this is time. I want you to start moving forward. And so I'm going to ask you this, of you and that, that you would ask this of other people, is that you would just be here over the next several weeks, that we can just really be united we can really uh, be set up and ready for the future, and we'll know who the lead pastor is in a couple of weeks, and then we'll go ahead, and God's going to continue to pick up and take us to another level here at Streamline Church. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God can do that? Yeah? So you weren't ready for that, but um, uh, I, I just wanted to make sure I share that, but thank you, Melissa, for your leadership in helping and steering, and she is so, um, Melissa's been coming to our church for about 14 years, and we started 15 years ago, so she's been bossing me around for a long time, 
but she has been so good to streamline church and even in this time. And so thank you, Melissa, for helping us. My pleasure. All right. Thank you. So I want to go ahead and I want to invite our speaker up today and share just a couple of things about uh, Pastor Kathy Cannon and her husband, Ben. She was senior pastor of Sacred Church for eight years over in San Bruno, right? And so she pastored that church and she was there and now she serves as the uh, director of, hold on, I'm going to get it, Thriving Church Planting at Northwest University up in Washington, and she does that remote. And she has a passion for church planting, uh, to love on church planters. She has been in ministry in so many different capacities. Her dad is here in the back today. He is also a senior pastor now, or Retired. He, he was for several years. And so anyway, I just wanted to introduce them. And she has family. I'm not about to go through all of that, and I'll <laughs> let you do that. But uh, I love one of my, the favorite things that I love about her husband, Ben. Well, one thing I don't love is he's a Seahawks fan. So he likes to talk a lot of trash on social media, and that's all right. We'll, we'll get past that. But the other thing is I love the T-shirt that he wore to our men's conference that said, I sleep with the pastor. <laughs> That's so awesome. That's so awesome. Anyway, all right. So, welcome. Come preach. That's such the intro, right? <laughs> hey, give her a great hand today. Would you welcome Pastor Kathy Cannon? Thanks, Dave. I appreciate your pastor so much. I've been involved in ministry here in Northern California, Nevada for, oh gosh, the last 16, 17 years at this point. And uh, met Dave pretty early on when we moved to California. And uh, got involved. We were involved in planting a church in Atomas at the time where I was serving as executive pastor. And so it wasn't long after that that Streamline was in the process. So I remember hearing about it through conversations in our network of ministry and then meeting Dave. Got to know Dave and Lori really well when we traveled to India together several years back and had a really great time on that trip. Um, just, I, there's nothing like getting to know someone until you go to as a group of 12 ministers get a massage. The awkward level in the room was so high at, what was it called, aroma tie? We were all getting a foot massage, right? So just imagine being in a room, like ladies, you're like, okay, yeah, well, you're gonna go get a foot massage. You're gonna roll up your pants. It's like everybody's in the same room. It's no big deal, that kind of thing. When the guy pastors all had to go change into like the big palazzo pants to get this done, and they were so embarrassed, right? Dave had been there before because he had traveled to India with his team, and it's something they do every single trip after they walk you all over the city of Kolkata. Then they take you to this place to kind of spoil you after lunch one day. And it was so fun because you get to know each other in those awkward moments of travel, don't you? You learn what somebody likes to eat, what somebody doesn't like to eat. You learn if they talk about reading their Bible or you actually get to see them reading their Bible. You know, those type, if they even brought a Bible on a trip with a full of pastors, you know, those type of things. And I will tell you, so not only have I traveled the world with Pastor Dave, I've actually traveled the world with Pastor Shar. And so I, and so he doesn't know that, but I will just tell you, I love uh, Pastor Shar. I call her Sister Sharla uh, on a regular basis. And we actually traveled for a couple of weeks to Ghana, West Africa together, just the two of us to go uh, work and visit some pastors there. And, and we have walked through villages and through high grass. We have uh, been up in the canopy of trees, 100 feet in the air, and, and she doesn't like heights whatsoever. And so you really get to know somebody. And I'm, all I'm going to say is she's amazing. She's a solid woman of God. So the reason Dave didn't introduce my whole family is because there's a lot of them and people don't remember the names of my children. Okay. So we have five of our six kids here today. Uh, my eldest child is 21. So she worked this morning until 6 a.m. But we have Jada, Jayshon, Jaren, Aja, Ari, and Amajale. And so most of my kids are here sitting with my dad and my mom. But also I want to mention, Dave mentioned my dad's a retired pastor. He actually just celebrated the, yesterday or the day before, was it? Day before, 51 years of ministry in our tradition in the church. So that is amazing. 51 years of being credentialed. 
Um, and so my mom was a career educator in the public school system, and so then we have a slew of children now, so you can see them. And yes, one of my kids did walk into church this morning wearing a Seahawks jersey. Okay, so we're excited about that. Now, right? So my journey to motherhood was a little different than the normal or the average. I will tell you that. For years and years, I avoided Mother's Day at church, um, and it was very difficult for me. That was hard because I was on staff at the church, and so it was my job to be there for things like Mother's Day, but I wanted to be behind, that scene, behind the scenes that day. I didn't want to be in the room when they were recognizing moms, because our plan when we got married was always have a couple kids, wait about eight or ten years, then adopt a couple of kids, and we were going to have four kids, and that was going to be it, and we were just going to have, you know, this perfect plan that you're going to go moving forward. Well, the have didn't work out for us. And so we dealt with years of infertility, which means lots of tests and treatments and all of those things just to find out none of it was going to work. So then years later down that path, uh, we went from zero children to three children overnight. You want to let that settle in? They were two, three, and four. Yeah, uh uh-huh. It just got different. They weren't like babies that just laid there, right? We had toddlers and preschoolers running around the house. Uh, But when my dear Jays, Jada, Jay, Sean, and Jaren made me a mom, and so they moved home uh, 12 years ago this past April 26. Two and a half years later to the day, uh, we had always talked about having four kids, And uh, once we had three kids, we were teaching them how to pray in the evening. And Jada, our oldest, started praying for a baby sister, as most little girls do at some point in their life, right? And so she kept praying for a baby sister and praying for a baby sister. And, you know, we thought, well, we always wanted four kids, right? So, you know, we'll go back. Our kids were all out of the Fawz Adopt system here in Sacramento. And so we thought we would talk to the social worker. And so one day, uh, Juan, our social worker, was there, and Jada looked right at him and said, I want a brown baby sister younger than Jaren. He was like, be specific. Okay, that's what you want. And then she started praying for a baby brother. And like any good pastor mom, I looked at my daughter and said, stop praying. Stop. That's not, that's not going to happen. There's a line between four kids and five. Four is a big family. Five is a little nuts. I still firmly believe that line exists. I just crossed it. Okay? She kept praying for this baby brother, and we kept saying, stop praying, darling. That's not going to happen. God already answered. His answer is no. Right? And she kept praying. Then she got her two brothers to start praying for a baby brother, because if they were going to have to get another girl in the family, they wanted another boy in the family so they'd still be ahead in the count right? And so they started praying, and we told every single social worker, no, 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 we don't want two kids. We're not going to do another sibling set. That's not going to happen. We've already done this multiple thing. We want one little girl. Just that's it. That's all we're going to take placement for. And one day, Emily from our agency called, and she said, I've told every worker no, every single one. And I don't know why, but for some reason, I told this one county worker, I'd at least call you And there's this brown baby sister. If you don't, if you haven't looked at them, all my kids are brown, so it'd been weird to have the one white kid, okay? So there's this brown baby sister. She's six months younger than Jaren. And then there's like this very pregnant pause. The only thing is she comes with a baby brother. I'm like, (gasps) now my husband had previously said no diapers. Like, younger than Jaren, fine, but no diapers. We are not doing any more diapers. I am finished with diapers. And so Emily then rushed immediately after that, but tell Ben he's potty trained, as if that was like a selling point for this boy to come into our family and our home. So we prayed about it. We're like, well, you know, we'll just meet with the social worker, and then, you know, we'll pray about it, and we're like, well, we'll just meet the kids. And so I would like to introduce you to Aja and baby brother Ari, (laughs) who then came home. Now, I said we have six kids, that's five, right? So two and a half years later to the day, October 26, 2012, 10 years ago this October, Aja and Ari came home to be part of our family forever. Years and years down the road, we had always known there was another A, Amajale, and 
Uh, she wasn't part of our family household unit yet, but we always knew she was part of the extended family. So years later, I was actually able to meet Amajale, who is a biological sibling to Aja and Ari as well. And so we are now in the process of an adoption for our eldest. I still call Jada my oldest, but Amajale is the eldest. She's 21, and so she will officially become a canon very soon as she is available for that at this point in her life. So now we have six kids, still no diapers, so that's good. We're going to wait We're gonna wait several, several children, several children years, okay, until we're dealing with diapers with grandkids, okay? So whether you were like me for years and you sat in a service for a Mother's Day and you're like, mm, I, you know, I, I have these dreams of motherhood and they don't exist, or maybe you've lost a child or maybe you've recently lost your mom and so you're dealing with that loss and pain or maybe it's just a strained relationship, it's not what you wish it would be and all of those different things. There can be so many different feelings around Mother's Day and so it's always been my pattern that when we gather as a church, Yes, we learn something about us, but that's not actually the point of us gathering together. The point is that we are learning something about our God, right? Now, the byproduct of that is we often learn about us. We learn about our lives. We learn about things that can be different. We learn about things that can be better. We learn about the blessings of God that he has on our life. But the purpose of gathering together isn't to talk about moms today. It's, it's to talk about God today. I did dive deep, though, into the Bible to find a really good passage on motherhood. It's not Proverbs 31. That woman never existed. Okay, just so you know. If you read the preface to that chapter, that was a mother-in-law telling her son that she, he was never going to find a woman as good as her. Okay, so we're not talking about Proverbs 31. We're actually digging deep into the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 28. So it's not all going to be up on the screen because I am going to read at the speed of light through a very interesting chapter in the Bible. Now, Deuteronomy is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, fifth book in the Bible, part of the core of the Old Testament called the Pentateuch is what we call that core of five books. And it's interesting because it relates a bunch of the speeches that Moses, the leader of God's people, gave over the course of his life and leadership with them. This is kind of the final hurrah and the record of, hey, remember these things that our leader said because they were about to go into the promised land without him. Okay, Moses had led them out of slavery. He would led them out of Egypt. They'd spent 40 years taking an 11-day walk. And so they were learning all of these things about the God that they served. Then they were thus learning all of these things about themselves. And it was time to enter the promise, time to take it captive, and he wasn't going to go with them. It's kind of in many ways where your church sits in a transition season right now, and I would reflect to you, having been a pastor who had to walk that experience of God calling me into something else, I now pastor other pastors, but being able to be the pastor, be the spiritual parent in a congregation, but then moving into something else and knowing that another pastor is going to come and parent their family. Moses had to have been thinking through some of the same thoughts at that point in the journey because someone else was going to take the people in to the promised land. So in this book, we have this reference, this remembrance of these speeches that he gave. And I don't think they sound like a dad at all. I actually think this particular chapter, chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, it's completely a mom chapter. Like this is how a mom who's been dealing with children for 40 years would deal with them. If you are 40 years old and you still haven't moved out, God bless you, but God bless your mama. Okay? If you still haven't figured it out, because the reason they hadn't entered the promised land yet was why? because they were going in circles. Any mamas ever had your children go in circles? And you're like, what are you doing? Why do we keep going over the same things over and over again? You must shower. <laughs> Brushing your teeth is not optional. I heard an amen. Mm-hmm. Right? 
Okay, I want you to turn around to somebody near you, and what is one of the things that especially maybe in your teen years, whether it was your mom biologically or foster adoptive or somebody who was raising you up, all right, what was the thing that they always had to remind you of? What was the thing they always had to remind you of? Go ahead. I, I can see whether you're turning or not. So you got to look at somebody. All right. What was it? All right. Who's got a good one? Who's got, what is it? Be on time. Mm. Who else has one? What did your mom have to remind you of? Oh, oh, can you say it louder for the people, aka my children, in the back? Every choice has a consequence or a Every choice has a consequence or a success. Now, I'm just, I know we've got some others, but I'm just going to go on right there because she's preaching my sermon. I want to go into this chapter with you. Deuteronomy chapter 28, if big if. You fully obey the Lord, your God, and carefully keep all his commands that I am giving you today. The Lord, your God, will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will experience all of these blessings if you obey your mama. No, the Lord, your God. That's what it actually says. All right, now I'm going to read this fast. The point is not to catch all of the details. I want you to listen for the patterns that are emerging in this passage, okay? Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your children, your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and your flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and bread baskets will be blessed. Wherever you go and whatever you do will be blessed. The Lord will conquer your enemies when they attack you. They will attack you from one direction and they will scatter from, or scatter from you in seven directions. The Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do will fill your storehouses with grain. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. If you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, the Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he swore he would do. Then all the nations of the world will see that you are a people claimed by the Lord, and they will stand in awe of you. The Lord will give you prosperity in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. He will give you a blessing with many children. He will give you numerous livestock and abundant crops. The Lord will send rain at the proper time. And the rich treasury in the heavens will bless all the work that you do. You will lend to many nations, but you'll never need to borrow from them. If you listen to these commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today, and if you carefully obey them, the Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you will always be on top and never at the bottom. You, will, you must not turn away from any of these commands I am giving you today, nor follow after any other gods and worship them. Amen. All the blessings. Isn't it wonderful? Right? We want all the blessings of God. And sometimes your mama will spend some time going, you know what, if you're going to do the right thing, you've got some privileges coming to you. If you clean your room, then you can go out. If you do this, then that, right? And you hear about these privileges. How many of you remember at some point in your life hearing about some privileges? Some of you were slow to raise your hand. So let me ask you this question. How many in your life remember about hearing about some consequences? No hesitation. Why is that? Why is it that we often remember hearing about the consequences a little more than we remember hearing about the privileges we might get? You know why? Because I just read 14 verses about the privileges. I just read 14 verses about the blessing of God that he would put on a specific group of people We can get the principle, but that promise was for those people. 14 verses. Let's get into the consequences, shall we? It starts at verse 15. And if you turn the page and then go to the next page, it ends at verse 68. You want to do the math? That's longer than 14. The list of consequences is significantly longer than the list of privileges. I'm not going to read them all, but let's just talk about how ugly it gets. But if you refuse to listen 
to, your, to the Lord your God and do not obey all the commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all of these curses will come and overwhelm you. Your towns and your fields will be cursed. Your fruit baskets and your breadboards will be cursed. Your children and your crops will be cursed. The offspring of your herds and your flocks will be cursed. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you will be cursed. The Lord himself will send on you curses, confusion, and frustration in everything you do until the last, at last you are completely destroyed. Isn't that lovely, Jesus? completely destroyed for doing evil and abandoning me. The Lord will afflict you with diseases until none of you are left in the land and you're about to enter and occupy. The Lord will strike you with wasting diseases, fever, inflammation, with scorching heat and drought. You'll live in Sacramento with blight and mildew. I don't like the weather here. These disasters will pursue you until you die. The skies above will be as unyielding as bronze. The earth beneath will be as hard as iron. The Lord will change the rain that falls on your land into powder and dust will pour down from the sky until you are destroyed. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's keep going. You're going to be defeated by your enemies. You'll be afflicted with the boils of Egypt, with the tumors, the scurvy, and the itch. Do you think that's random, or do you think it's the fact that he's saying you're going to take back everything you've gained, and you'll end up back in Egypt? You'll be engaged to a woman, but another man's going to sleep with her. You'll build a house, somebody else is going to live in it. You'll plant a vineyard, but you'll never enjoy the fruit. Your ox is going to be butchered before your eyes, but you will not eat a single bite of the meat. Someone else is taking your steak off of the grill. The Lord's going to exile you and your king to a nation unknown to you and your ancestors. You'll plant much, but you're going to harvest little because the locusts are going to eat your crops. I'm just going paragraph by paragraph for the top line. Foreigners living among you will become stronger and stronger while you become weaker and weaker. They'll lend money to you, but you won't lend to them. If you refuse to listen to the Lord your God and obey the commands and the decrees he's given you, all of these curses will pursue you and overtake you again until you're destroyed. The Lord will bring a distant nation against you from the end of the earth. It's going to swoop down on you like a vulture. The siege and terrible distress of the enemy's attack will be so severe that you'll eat the flesh of your own offspring if you refuse to obey the words of the instructions that are written in this book. If you do not fear the glorious and awesome name of your Lord, the Lord will overwhelm you and your children with indescribable plagues. Just as the Lord has found great pleasure in causing you to prosper and multiply, this is a very strange verse. This is chapter 28, verse 63. The Lord will find pleasure in destroying you. We're going to come back to that in a second. You'll be torn from the land you're about to enter and occupy. The Lord will scatter you among all the nations from one end of the earth to the other. You will worship foreign gods, and neither you nor your ancestors have known gods made of wood and stone. There among those nations you'll find no peace, no place to rest, and the Lord will cause your heart to tremble, your eyesight to fail, your soul to despair. Your life will constantly hang in the balance. Amen. You will live night and day in fear, unsure if you're going to survive. In the morning you will say, if only it were night. In the night you will say, if only it were morning. You'll be terrified by the awful horrors that you see around you. Then the Lord will send you back to Egypt in ships to a destination I promised that you would never see again. And this ending line, you'll offer to sell yourselves to your enemies as slaves and they're not even going to buy you. Yay! Forty-some verses of curses. Fourteen of the blessings. All the remaining curses. Before you head out the door, did your mama tell you all the good things that might happen? Or did maybe that person trying to guide you, guard you about things that might come? 
It's amazing as Christians, especially in modern America, how we love to read the Old Testament and we like to read these promises, the blessing portion, those first 14 verses, and say, amen, hallelujah, that's for me. I receive it in the name of Jesus, right? I want all the blessings, but we never read the rest of it. Because when we read the rest, we're like, oh, you have to read that in context, right? You have to put that in that especially applied to that group of people in that time and space. So those curses, those consequences do not apply to me. Well, I cannot get the blessings and the privileges if I don't also understand the consequences and the curses of my life. That's what raising someone up is about. That's what Moses was doing to the people of God. He was trying to raise them up to understand you are in a relationship here. There has to be reciprocity. It goes both ways. God has told you, God has already reminded them of all of these things over and over and over again. If you think your mom told you to clean your room a lot, read the Old Testament. Because God had to tell the people of Israel to clean up their lives over and over and over ad nauseum. Again and again, God kept returning to them. It's like there's a verse in Jeremiah that so many of us have memorized and we really love it. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. We love to take that verse and say, yes, Lord, that is for me. And the next verse says, after 70 years of exile. Huh? So so I don't get to understand the blessing on my life until 70 years from now? I don't know. I'm 41. I don't know if I'm going to be alive. I don't think I want to be alive 70 years from now, to be honest. Do you know what happened in this passage for the people of Israel? They were about to enter in. Over 900 years for this to live out. For them to understand the differences between the blessings and the curses, what would happen took over 900 years. See, when we make decisions about our lives today, here's the principle here. When we say this is what God has said for my life, that there is blessing and there is abundance, but there are also consequences and curses, I get to choose We are not just choosing what's going to happen for the rest of my lifetime on this earth. I am also making decisions about what happens for generation and generation and generations past my breath here. When I decide how I'm going to grow up myself and then how I'm going to grow up others, I am making decisions that don't just affect my next however many years. It's not just the 70 of Jeremiah, but it's also the 950 of this passage. Am I willing to look at all of it and say it's not just the blessing that's the privilege available to me, but there's also consequences and decisions that are available to me? When I look at all of those, (laughs) it ain't fun. It's not nice to read 40-some verses of things that could go wrong. And a lot of that is because it's things we can't even imagine, right? Living in this country, we can complain about things and talk about politics and disagree and agree and all of those different things, but we really honestly cannot imagine what these people were living through. There are people other places in the world who can, who have a better idea of that. But if you look back hundreds of years in the history of this land, people were living very differently. And those of us in this room, if we were living back then, our lives would have looked very different from one another, wouldn't they? We can't always talk about the good old days 100 years ago because for a lot of people it wasn't so good. But even then, can we imagine what all of this would mean in our lifetime to face it, but could they have imagined the life we live today? Could they have imagined the life that we live in Sacramento today? 
Did they understand that decisions that they were making would affect generation after generation? Did the people of Israel understand that they were making decisions for the people of God for generation after generation? Or did they just want to enjoy the great fruit that was going to be in the new land? Did they just want to enjoy the victories and all of those things and not recognize that their choices could also set up hard things for the next generation? You don't have to raise your hand, but for some of you, you are living out the consequences of a previous generation's choices. Some of you are living out the blessings of a previous generation's choices. The common word there was choice. That's what we all have. That's the commonality of this passage because over and over again, what does the leader say? God says, if, if, because we weren't created like robots. We weren't created to just do whatever God wants us to do and move around. We were created for if. We were created for opportunity. Because when one generation makes a decision, yes, it affects the next, but that generation also gets to make a decision. They also get to change things. That's what's going to happen, honestly, in the next few months around here. Things will change. Right? A different pastor. Things are going to change at Streamline. And you may be tempted to be like, well, that's not the way we used to do it. Okay. You might not parent the way your parents did. That might be a good thing. That might not be a good thing. I don't know you. But over generation, each time, with each leadership change, with each generation change, with each year that you grow, that you learn, aren't you glad you can make a different decision than you did 10 years ago? Aren't you glad that you can all of a sudden say, I had these promises from God and I completely walked away from them, but guess what? He is willing to circle back with me. That I have the principles of the Old Testament that time and time again, he was willing to wait a thousand years for them to come back around. And he is willing to wait one for you. He's willing to wait months for you. He's willing to wait until the end of the message for you. You could decide right now or you can decide in 10 years. God's there. He's present in those moments. He's present in your choices for change. Because if is the common word. Because choice is the common word. And here's the best part of all of it. This is the Old Testament. The reason we like the blessings and not the curses is because they tend to be tangible in the Old Testament. All the blessings are monetary and property and generations and good health. It's all the tangible stuff. And all of the curses and consequences are tangible. You will literally be drug into slavery. You will literally be at war and you will lose. You will literally not have enough food to eat. You will literally start cannibalism. That you caught that that's one of those lines, right? You will literally go through all of these things. And then it says that just like God rejoiced in the blessings on your life, he will like the bad things. It's a, a very difficult verse there. So once again, let me just draw this back to moms real quick. Have you ever watched your kid or you know the grin on your parent's face Okay, some of you are smiling because you know where I'm taking this, right? When they just crossed their arm and said, you'll see. You'll see. They have laid out for you what could happen good, what could happen bad, or maybe as a parent, you have laid out, here's your chance, or you have this. And you know that no matter what they choose, they're going to learn. You no matter what choice is made, your parent knew whatever choice you would make, you're going to learn. And you just laugh. Like, okay, go learn your lesson. Can you imagine God looking at his people hundreds of years 
while they circled around relationship with him. Can you imagine God looking out at your life for year after year as you've circled around good decisions versus bad decisions, right relationship, wrong relationship, and he's like, you really want a good testimony, don't you, kid? And he just watches you. That's what that is. Because this book is written by people trying to understand and communicate God, and all they see is we either have stuff or we don't. It's either working for us or it's not. And why does it still feel like I can hear this chuckling from above? Because he's willing to stick with me while I learn the lesson. Because he knows that just as he's willing to come back around, I will come back around. I will come back around. And for the people of God, this shows how much he loves us all. Not, he loves us individually as we individu- wow, individualized that worship song earlier. He loves us so much individually, but he loves us as the people because he was willing to circle back around. If you go over to the New Testament, the book of Galatians, a letter that one of the pastoral leaders in the New Testament wrote to the church, In Galatians chapter 3, I'm going to start reading with verse 11, then they're going to put it up on the screen. So it's clear, because we were just reading from the law, right? It's clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. Amen and hallelujah for all of you, including my children, who feel like you can never get everything right that your mom wants you to do. For the scriptures say it's not through the law. That's the thing. It is through faith that a righteous person has life. This is the way faith is very different from the way of the law, which says it's through obeying the law that a person has life. But Christ, see, that's what changes it all. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. All of those bad things that can happen in our life, all of those tangible things that for the next 950 years could destroy your family, could destroy your legacy, could destroy the future. Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it's written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. Verse 14, through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles, a.k.a. non-Israelites from the Old Testament, with the same blessing that he promised Abraham. That was those 14 verses over and over again said in many different ways to the people of God. So that we who are believers, that's us, might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. See, the entire point of the New Test- or Old Testament is to show us stuff we can't get right. If you obey everything, we all know we're not going to. Just like you know your kid's not going to obey everything you've ever told them to do, just because you know you didn't obey everything your mama ever told you to do. We know it's not going to happen. We talk about God is a good father, but in this respect, he is like the good mother as well, who says, I will circle back around. And at the end of the day, it's the faith. It's the the foundation of our relationship of understanding that Christ died for us and he took away all of the penalty, all of the consequences, so that when you screw up and you decide you're going to circle back around and come home, your bed's there. Now, I was a goody two-shoes, so I never got in trouble with my parents. You can ask them. They're here. Okay? One of my favorite things that my mom did, I grew up in the country, like super rural. But Friday nights were football games. Now, I don't have an athletic bone in my body. My children are thankful they don't have my DNA because they are all athletes, and if they had my DNA, that would not be helpful whatsoever for their sports pursuits. I led the band. (laughs) So every Friday night, I was at a football game in the fall. And it was cold where I lived in the fall. 
So we'd have layers on and, you know, band uniform and all of that stuff. But then I'm an extrovert and I like to talk. And, and since I was a goody two-shoes, I didn't really have a curfew. We would just discuss it and have a conversation. My children don't like that conversation, but um, they're not goody two-shoes. So I would get home and I would be freezing because, if, as I said, I grew up in a small town in the country. There was nowhere to go. There was like, there weren't even any places that could be open. So we would sit on the curb at the school or sit in the bleachers and just talk and hang out for hours after the game. So at midnight, you'd be sitting there and your behind would be frozen solid to the bleachers or to the curb at the sidewalk at the school. And eventually you'd run out of things to talk about and you're going to see each other tomorrow anyway, right? So, because, you know, no cell phones, teenagers. We didn't have cell phones in the 90s. So we'd get in our cars and we'd drive home. And what I love that my mom did is I would go up to my room and the rule was I had to wake them up, tell them I was home turn off the light, lock the door, and then I'd go upstairs to my room. I would go up and the covers would be turned down and my electric blanket would be turned on. It's still a wonderful thought. My cold self being able to tuck in the warm covers. I'm going to ask the worship team if you guys would come join me up here as we close. There's that, that sense memory that I can get. And if you've ever been freezing or, you know, suffering, and then all of a sudden you feel cocooned, you feel comforted, you feel wrapped up. Can you imagine that moment right now? See, the difference between a lot of what we experience now is that our blessings and our consequences are intangible. Yes, the tangible stuff happens, okay? But we all know great people and really horrible people do well financially. We all know that Paul, the guy who wrote the book of Galatians, called his life this present suffering. (laughs) Doesn't sound like he was tangibly blessed when he was writing from jail. But he still felt the blessings of God because he talks about in that verse how it was the promise of the Holy Spirit who Jesus called the comforter, the blanket that wraps us up. See, God still talks to us through the word. He still tells us about how he looks at us. And we can read these passages in pages of blessings and consequences. And I can say with all confidence that the very specifics of those do not apply to me because they apply to a specific people living in a specific time and place in history. But the principles are all there. Because if it wasn't, we wouldn't have needed Jesus to come and take the curses. If the blessings and curses, the, the, excuse me, the concept of me living a life of if, me living a life of choices, weren't true for you and I, weren't true for us as a body of believers, as a church family. We make decisions together about moving forward. Are we going to do it in right relationship? Are we going to do it the way God has called us to as community? Or are we going to allow ourselves to be scattered? Are we going to allow ourselves to fall away and live in exile? Are we going to allow ourselves to suffer all of the intangible feelings of failure? I don't have to because all I have to do is circle back and I know he's there. All I have to do is circle back and I know he's circling my life with me, that he is fully and always present, that Jesus said, yeah, I'm here tangibly for a while to his disciples, but I have to leave tangibly. So I'm sending you an intangible promise, the feeling of being wrapped up in a warm blanket after a cold night, the feeling of coming in from a life of consequence into a life of blessing, the feeling of coming in to someone who is doing their mom and job right and put down the covers for you. Will you stand with me this morning?
Father, I pray right now for our hearts to be open. For some people in the room, it might be open to the healing of the Holy Spirit's work. Maybe it's just open to the presence of the Holy Spirit. They've talked about Jesus in the tangible ways, but have yet to feel that intangible, overwhelming presence of blessing, of joy over our life. Even the giggle when we're making the wrong choice, but God knows you're learning, you're learning. Father, today I pray that we go from this place knowing more about a good God who loves us, who just like strong and good parents discipline us at times, teach us about the privileges and the consequences, but that we choose. We live a life of if and we make the decision to move forward with him. God's people said, amen. Will you worship with us? And told my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, who oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life, all my life, you have been faithful. Come on, tell them this morning. All my life, you have been so, so. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness, your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me all my life and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so, so good with every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Can we just thank Pastor Kathy for coming and sharing today? And we're the moms. You know, I just think about how God has always circled back for me and also for you and the goodness that he has. And moms, I would say this, continue to just circle back because we're knuckleheads. How many of you got a knucklehead for a kid? Right? Right? Okay. Anyway, hey, and one thing I would add is this before I close is a lot of times we say, hey, thank you, I love you, blah, blah, to whoever we're talking to. But I, I would say this today. When you want to honor your mom or give her a card or, or show her affection, whatever it is, would you have a memory in mind that you can share with your mom? Hey, I remember when you did this. That just sticks out to me. Or when you, when you did this for me, or, or you know what, you've always been like this, and I'm so thankful 
for you in that way. Isn't that a big difference? It's a big difference. And so I want to encourage you to do that. Um, we have uh, a couple of things. We have the gifts for the moms on your way out today, so make sure you get that. And then there's also a photo booth. So moms, you can pull your family in, your kids in, whatever you want to do. There's a photo booth out there. And then uh, I was like, man, I'm kind of jealous because moms get stuff and we don't get anything. Right? I, I know. I know it's your day, but hold on. So I got something. So, so I got some Krispy Kremes today. Uh, for the rest of us. No, I'm just kidding. Festivus for the rest of us. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So, hey, hey, uh, no, for everybody, we got some Krispy Kremes uh, for you in the back. I'm actually going to serve them, and I'll be at your service, but we'll have some milk with that. And so we just want you to stick around. Enjoy the, the community that we have here, okay? Church, you are God's treasure possession. Your heavenly Father is proud of you. He watches over you, and he will take care of you. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, and he will help you. Because of Jesus Christ, you can be anything, and you can do anything. You are the hands and feet of Jesus in a lost and dying world. You are a difference maker. Nothing can take away God's greatness in your life. Help me out. You are blessed. Amen. Happy Mother's Day.